All right, this segment will hopefully get us uh, finished up with stress and health, and we're going to pick up now with the third type of hassle, and that is conflict. Uh, of all life's troubles, conflict is probably the most common. In the 1930s, Kerr Lewin described conflict in terms of two opposing tendencies, approach and avoidance. When something attracts us, we want to approach it. When something frightens us, we try to avoid it. Lewin showed how different combinations of these tendencies create three basic types of conflict, and you see these here. Let's start with approach-approach conflict. This occurs when a person is simultaneously attracted to two appealing goals. A student who's, who has been accepted to two equally desirable colleges or universities. Some of you might be in that boat right now. A job seeker who's offered two equally exciting and high-paying positions, or a person who finds two equally attractive apartments. So there are uh, really uh, numerous examples of this. The reverse of this dilemma would be a different type of conflict, and this would be avoidance-avoidance, in which the person is confronted by two undesirable or threatening possibilities, neither of which has any positive features. The popular way of expressing this dilemma is being caught between a rock and a hard place. When faced with avoidance-avoidance conflict, people usually try to escape the situation altogether. If escape is, escape is impossible, they try to select the least threatening option, or the lesser of two evils. So uh, you're stuck between two things you don't want, and if you have to choose, you'll choose the lesser of two evils. Now the third type of conflict that uh, Lewin came up with was Approach avoidance, and in this one a person is both attracted to and repelled by the same goal. This is actually the most common form of conflict, and it's, too, uh, it's often uh, very difficult to resolve. According to Lewin, the closer we come to a goal with good and bad features, the stronger our beliefs, uh, our desires, stronger grow our desires both to approach and to avoid, but the tendency to avoid increases more rapidly than the tendency to approach. A familiar example is a, cu a couple whose only quarrel is that one wants to get married but the other is unsure. The second person wants to continue the relationship that's approached, but is wary of making a long-term commitment that's avoidance. In real life, we're often faced simultaneously with two or more goals, each of which is less ideal, but each of which also has enough positive features to attract us. All right, so let's take a look at our next uh, issue, which is stress and individual differences. Um, one of the things that uh, we find with stress and individual differences is that an individual's overall appraisal of life and general attitude towards events, especially optimism and pessimism, play a huge role here. The classic expression of this difference is that presented with the same circumstances an optimist sees the glasses as half the glass as half full, a pessimist sees the glass as half empty. Optimists tend to appraise events as challenges rather than threats, to remain hopeful when the odds are not in their favor, to focus on what they can do to improve a situation rather than uh, thinking about what they can't change, and to take pleasure and pride in what they do accomplish rather than dwelling on failure. failures. Pessimists are obviously the, opt the opposite. Optimism and pessimism have, in turn, been related to your locus of control, and that's L-O-C-U-S, and that's the idea of how much you think you're in control of your own situation and your life. Individuals who have an internal locus of control tend to believe that their circumstances are largely the result of their own decisions and actions, and hence appraise situations as challenges. Individuals uh, uh, who have external locus of control control tend to see themselves as victims of circumstance, doubt their ability to defend themselves or to improve their situation, and are more likely to appraise events negatively or as threats. Now, a, uh, another individual difference between people is whether or not they are hardy and or resilient. So this is hardiness and resiliency. Uh, researchers in 79 identified a trait that they called hardiness. Uh, found in people who tolerate stress exceptionally well or even seem to thrive on it. Stress-hardy people are open to change and, of course, rather than viewing the loss of a job as a setback um, or a catastrophe, they define the situation as an opportunity to begin a new career. Researchers have found that 
To a significant degree, people's response to stress depends on whether or not they believe they have some control over events or whether or not they feel helpless. Individuals who have little confidence that they can master new situations and exercise control often feel powerless and apathetic, and so their hardiness is probably not going to be very strong. Now, other psychologists are interested in something called resilience, and that's the ability to bounce back or recover one's confidence, good spirits, and hopeful attitude after extreme or prolonged stress. Studies with children show those with nurturing backgrounds and those who have more friends tend to be more resilient. One example of this was a research study done with 240 high-risk children in Hawaii who had experienced stress at birth poverty, and family conflict, and followed their development for 40 years. Two-thirds of the children had become involved in crime or developed psychological problems, but one-third became confident, competent, caring adults. The resilient members of this sample tended to be um, affectionate and outgoing from birth, which attracted other people to them. They had interests, interests and talents that helped them to make friends, develop a sense of purpose, and gain self-esteem. Equally important, they had warm, supporting relationships with at least one adult other than their parents who viewed them as special and important. Compared to their troubled peers and to a control group of children who grew up in secure environments, the resilient children grew into adults with the highest percentage of stable marriages and lowest proportions of unemployment, divorce, and serious health problems. Another study of adolescents whose parents suffer from depression found that the most resilient teenagers had a strong relationship with an outside adult and a hobby at which they excelled, both of which gave them a sense of value. Now, taken together, these studies also suggest that two ways to foster resilience in high-risk children are mentor programs, such as the Big Brother, Big Sister program, which teams an adult volunteer with a needy child, and after-school programs that offer a range of activities. A final difference in people is self-imposed stress, and of course this is often caused by unreasonable beliefs and expectations. And you can see three of these types, or three types of these uh, unreasonable expectations listed here. The, the idea that you have to be loved or approved by almost everyone for everything that I do. There's a whole bunch of trouble with that one, uh, starting with the fact that um, it's not reasonable to begin with, but then secondly, you're allowing what other people feel and how they respond to you to be the dictator of how you feel about yourself. Secondly, I must be competent, adequate, and successful at everything I do. Obviously, that's not totally reasonable because there will be times when you don't achieve what it is that you think you should do. And finally, it is disastrous if everything doesn't go the way I would like. Well, obviously another uh, idea that doesn't have a whole lot of validity because there will always be things that are with, that are outside of our control and if you remember, as we talked uh, during cognition, um, there's actually a lot more that we don't control than we really think. And in fact, we have a lot less control over our lives than many people would actually like us to have. So, how do we cope with stress? Well, there's two types, direct coping and defensive coping. The definition of coping is to make cognitive and behavioral efforts to manage psychological stress. So in these two types of coping, one is intentional and the other is defensive. Um, so let's take a look at uh, the three types of direct coping. They start with confrontation. Now this would definitely make some sense. You attack the problem head on. The hallmark of confrontational style is to make intense efforts to cope with the stress and to accomplish one's goals. This may involve learning new skills, enlisting other people's help, or even trying harder. Confrontation may also include expressions of anger. Anger may be effective, especially if we've been treated unfairly and we express our anger with restraint rather than exploding in rage. An example of using this technique was actually reported by a national magazine uh, that gave this sort of amusing and effective example of controlled anger in response to annoying little hassles. As a motorist came to an intersection, he had to stop for a frail old lady crossing the street. The driver of the car behind him honked his horn impatiently, whereupon the first driver shut off his engine, removed the key, walked back to the other car, and handed the key to the second driver. Here, he said, you run over her. I can't. She reminds me of my grandmother. So, um, obviously angry, but using it in sort of a humorous way. Now, 
there's a lot of that example that would probably not be applicable in real life. Uh, but the idea that you come up with a, uh, a method of dealing with the problem that uh, doesn't escalate things is probably a pretty good idea. Second, uh, the second type of direct uh, coping is compromise. This is one of the most common and effective ways of coping directly with conflict or frustration. We often recognize that we can't have everything we want and we can't expect others to do just what we would like them to do. In such cases, we may decide to settle for less than we had originally sought. Uh, you may, you know, compromise, obviously, on many different things. And uh, you may not get everything you want, but then again, you will get some of it. So it's, a, it's an interesting way of dealing with it, but you do settle the problem. And that's uh, part of the idea of intentional or direct coping. The third type of uh, direct coping is withdrawal. Now that sounds a little counterintuitive because you're stepping away. We often disparage withdrawal as a refusal to face problems, but sometimes withdrawal is a positive and realistic response, uh, such as when we realize our adversary is too powerful for us, or that there's no way we can effectively change ourselves, alter the situation, or reach a compromise, and that any form of aggression would be self-destructive. Perhaps the greatest danger of coping with withdrawal is that we would then begin to use this too often and come to avoid situations just so that we wouldn't have to uh, confront anyone. So it sounds counterintuitive, but withdrawal is actually a technique of going right at it because you do deal with the problem right away. Now, let's take a look at defensive coping, which is um, uh, a different way of coping with stress. When we do this, this is actually self-deception to protect ourselves um, and our self-esteem and to reduce stress. We, uh, we often do this when we can't identify where the stress comes from or we can't deal directly with the source of our stress. In such situations, many people automatically adopt defense mechanisms as a way of co coping. Now, we'll go over all the defense mechanisms in uh, the personality chapter, but the idea is that uh, we do something like just deny that it's there, we uh, pretend like we didn't care, um, all the things that we'll talk about as defense mechanisms. But over the long run, using defense mechanisms can hinder successful adjustment. So the idea being that uh, you want to, uh, you, you have to sort of fool yourself a little bit to get through it, but you have to be careful not to use it too often. So uh, one of the questions then is, um, what is it that actually causes the styles of coping that we choose? Uh, it's tempting to conclude that those styles come from within the individual, but research shows that it's a mix of nature and nurture. Uh, one of the uh, side notes to this is the question of gender and coping. So the question is, are there gender differences in coping with stress? And at present, the answer seems to be yes, at least under some circumstances. In numerous studies, it was found that women responded a little bit differently to a particular stressful situation than men did. Um, in fact, a rec another recent study suggests that males and females across species respond to stress in different ways. Uh, when a student casually mentioned that most stu studies of stress in animals were carried out with male rats, psychologist Shelley Taylor and her colleagues reviewed several hundred studies of stress in rodents, monkeys, and humans, and they, they found that in studies of humans, only 17% of the subjects were female. The researchers also found that females didn't fit the standard pattern. Rather, danger seemed to evoke a tend-and-friend response in females who tend to their young and seek contact and support from others, especially other females. For example, women, com women coming home from a bad day at work spend time with their children or call a friend. Men tend to withdraw or get into arguments. This might also ex help to explain why females are less likely than males to be physically aggressive. The tend and befriend response may be linked to the hormone oxytocin, which is produced during childbirth and nursing and linked to maternal behavior and social affiliation. Research shows that oxytocin makes rats and humans calmer, more social, and less fearful. Under stress, both males and females secrete oxytocin, but the male hormone testosterone seems to reduce its effect, whereas the female hormone estrogen amplifies the effect. And we will talk about the ramifications of this and try to finish up the uh, stress and health chapter in the next segment.